start with our the first talk um, today. Um, I'm, uh, as I introduce myself, I'm Christian Kropworst. I'm wearing the hat of a floodplains manager for the community of Hall in Massachusetts. Um, I do, first of all, I'd like to introduce our co-authors and our uh, co-speaker today, Bella um, Purdy Tizzle, who is um, our consultant from um, Weston and Sampson. And also I wanted to recognize Joanna Nadal, who is our, um, our public engagement um, expert in this. And we're going to be talking about uh, an adaptation uh, plan and a retreat sort of component um, in the community of, of Hall. And I just wanted to, to sort of highlight where this is located. Um, again, we're in the um, state of Massachusetts. And the reason I have this up there is because I also wanted to do a shout out to our previous administration, Charlie Baker and our current administration, uh, Barbara Healy for providing the resources we heard earlier today that a lot of the community work really needs to have those resources. And a shout out to Maria at uh, the federal panel this morning talking about federal match and all of those issues. Um, as you can see, the community we're talking about is a coastal community on the outer reaches of Boston Harbor. It's highlighted in light blue. On, on the panel that you see up there. I hope you can see that well. Um, it's a really an interesting area. Um, it provides, it's a barrier beach to um, the communities that surround metro, uh, the metropolitan region of Boston. Um, back in the day, this, this area was known as Nan, Nan, Nantascot um, and was settled by the um, First Nation people. And it's in, um, as you can imagine, was a sandy coastal barrier beach with uh, vibrant migrating coastal dunes. And it certainly doesn't look like that today, as you can imagine. It's a highly, um, a highly developed peninsula. Most of these homes that you see here in this peninsula were built at the turn of the century, so 1900 or so. Um, also, um, here's a um, annual flood chance of flood risk map um, showing flood elevations of uh, you know sea level rising to 1.2 feet. And I'm going to put a date on this. When does this project out to 2030, 2050? Um, anyway, um, just I think one of the key features in this is the gray areas. Those are the sort of the high areas of this community, about 60 to 70 percent of this community lies within the floodplain. Um, so uh, flooding is often an issue and the community is quite aware of um, issues and understanding sea level rise, but their understanding is something we're gonna talk about today and something that um, as a practitioner, um, we're getting, um, uh, getting to better know how to communicate that. Um, Specifically, though, um, we're, we're talking about um, really how do we adapt uh, to climate change? And we explored um, beginning to have a converse, the conversation on retreat. And we, call, we initially began to look at this as a managed retreat exercise and to capture it into an adaptation plan, something we heard today that was probably a good idea to do. But then we realize that maybe this really isn't a managed retreat, but a planned retreat effort. Uh, we haven't had that big catastrophic event where a retreat needs to be managed, but hey, uh, we, we know that we're gonna see some sea level rise. We know that the predictions are quite interesting. Um, one aspect uh, is that we're projected to see about 28 feet of sea level by 2030. What, what's that? Eight years? Wait, seven years from now. So, you know, uh, there's a, there's was some discussion about implementing things on the national level to get funding available in over two or three years, maybe having something in place. Um, usually, when I go to grant uh, funders seeking funds to do projects, um, I try to press to them the reality that we're real. How am I doing on time, Bella? Should we get? Uh, moving ahead. So quickly, just the area we're talking about. Does can we do sort of a planned retreat aspect on the scale of a neighborhood? 
Um, how does it fit into uh, what the town is trying to do to address flooding in this area? So this is the area we're talking about. A uh, little lying area that is um, straddled by two um, relic drums of high elevation land on either side out of the floodplain. Um, an area that has been historically, if you can see the old ancient map, uh, a marsh area and a connection between two components of Boston Harbor. And it's been developed. And it continues to try to turn, return back to that natural state. Um, it currently is experiencing flooding on about you know, about a 2% level. And by 2030, seven years from now, it'll be a um, uh, percent probability of flooding 100%. We're almost seeing that now. And I'll just show you some uh, quick pictures of that. So this is currently some of the flooding that this area sees in that area. If you look on your left, there is a building that sort of looks like it's on an island. Um, you'll see some of the other pictures that show where that's located. That is actually the town's sewer pump station to handle um, the homes in this area. So it's, it's you know, it, we need to address it now. One of the things we wanted to do is how do we do this? And so we had a couple of big questions we wanted to ask. And, um, you know, what is the town's responsibility here? You know, folks have homes here. Uh, we have assets we need to um, protect, uh, we need to maintain the roads so we have access to the area. Um, and, you know, um, um, how do we, how do, what, what can we do? What is the plan then that we can ensure at least the livability in this area in the near term? And how do we begin to have this conversation about maybe some drastic um, um, scenarios down the road? So with that, Bella, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Bella. Um, I'm a consultant for the town of Hull, and I work at Weston and Sampson. Um, and so what you'll see here is um, one of the potential designs that we're developing for 2030. Sorry about that. Um, so as you can see on the screen, we're coming up with potential um, design options for 2030 that include several of those strategies that were in uh, the roadmap that I showed in the previous slide. So apologies, um, it's a little bit small, but as you can see in the central part of the site in the green, that's where an existing park is today, but it has um, compacted earth. It doesn't have very much vegetation or programming. And so we're proposing putting a um, constructed wetland at that central part of the site with some grading changes, new vegetation that would essentially act as um, bioretention during precipitation events and high tides. And that design would also include an elevated boardwalk and some program space. Um, so residents would see other improvements and co-benefits. And then the two shoreline solutions include um, a new barrier system and also living shoreline. So we're combining sort of a hard gray infrastructure solution um, with the nature-based solution. And so this 2030 design is really trying to minimize impacts on private property and respond to requests that residents have been making to the town for um, several years now, including um, repairing the barrier wall that's on the eastern side of the site. And so part of building trust and starting the conversation around retreat is really to show action today that the town is, um, you know, making these first steps before really asking private property owners to make even larger steps in moving. But we're also trying to think about what this area might look like in 2070. And at that point, we imagine many more um, residential homes will be impacted, as you can see in the red. Um, and so we're proposing to basically transform this site back to nature through ecological restoration to mimic the historic maps that Chris previously showed you. Um, these are designs that we've started to show as a potential vision to residents. Um, it's been very contentious, but as I mentioned, people do kind of appreciate the um, co-visioning that we're doing to together, kind of co-designing for the future. Um, this is a a, a neighborhood that has many families that have lived for years. It's multi-generational and people, you know, have said they plan to pass on their home to their children. So part of this is to say, you know, well, what can your children have in return? Can they accept a buyout? Can the town use something like a town uh, right of first refusal to sort of transition from this cycle of, um, you know, many generations living here, but people still building equity in the future? 
Um, I am getting close to time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, but we've had um, a couple of great engagement events through this first year of the project. Um, turnout really hasn't been a, a problem, which is amazing. That can be a big challenge um, for engagement, but residents are very invested and very interested in showing up for this project. We've had um, workshops where we've used interactive engagement tools. You'll see um, at the top of the screen, people are holding up green, yellow, and orange cards. So they're, they use those to sort of to respond to different statements or ideas. Um, we did focus groups, so having opportunities for smaller conversations with residents. And then um, we just had two weekends ago um, an open house and a site walk to talk about these strategies and roadmaps. So we had a chance to walk around the neighborhood. Um, we had a ton of residents come and really look property by property and say, you know, what's going to happen here in the future. And that was a great opportunity to kind of build momentum around this project. So what did we hear? Um, we've heard a lot. There's really a wide range of responses. Mostly, I don't want to move at this point. Um, and there are you know, many different reasons for that. Uh, there's a big concern about the housing market. Am I going to get basically what I paid for for my house? Um, I've lived here for many years. I grew up here um, since I was a child. I don't want to move. Um, and then some people who don't want to move today, but have said, you know, I'm evaluating every five years. You know, I, I understand what the risks are here. And um, every five years, I plan to look at my property value. I plan to look at what events have been experienced in this area and kind of evaluate what I'm going to do next. So lessons learned. Um, so many lessons have been learned. There's a lot of complexity and a lot of uncertainty. I think most importantly, you have to kind of be willing to meet people where they're at and hold all of the emotion um, that comes with these conversations. People are going to be mad. They're going to be upset. They might be hopeful. And just being there to listen and to talk with them about sort of the future of this neighborhood has been really important. Um, you know, different methods work to reach different people. We've been using a combination of direct outreach through flyers, um, using an email thread that residents have joined, and they'll actually give us feedback on events. And then we kind of modify and tailor our approach going forward. So they'll say, hey, this didn't work well for us. Or, you know, next time, can you please reach out in this way? We try to incorporate that as we go. Um, trust is very fragile. Wording is really important. And sometimes we use words that um, may not land as we want or mean something different than what they might mean to us. So one example is I use the word trade-offs with someone that I was talking with, and that was very triggering and upsetting. It's like trade-offs, you know, this is my, my life. Like, what are you talking about? So the nuance of just how you're speaking um, with residents about plan retreat is super important. Um, and like I said, a comprehensive approach, like using data, um, using a variety of strategies, meeting people where they are, trying to make um, engagement sort of dynamic, um, having a variety of methods that's been uh, successful for us so far. And this is a multi-year process. So we look forward to continuing to sort of grow this process and learn from residents as we continue a very uh, difficult conversation. So um, thank you very much. Hello, so the next speaker is remote and her name is Diana Matt. So if you can hear us. Yes, we can hear you. I'm here with my co-presenter and actually our, my co-presenter, uh, Katie Call is going to share her screen if she's able to do that. Yeah. For our presentation, terrific. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to allow us to um, present virtually to you all this afternoon. I'm Diane Moss, the Chief Resilience and Sustainability Officer at Fuss and O'Neill. And I'm joined by my co-presenter, Katie Call from the University of Massachusetts Amherst to discuss reimagining water dependent educational and recreational institutions in coastal areas. So the concept for this presentation came out of our work at Fuss and O'Neill with clients and collaborators at institutions that are in coastal areas that were dealing with how to address adaptation 
uh, to climate change and to consider retreat while maintaining their core mission as a recreational or institutional, uh, recreational or educational institution. So for organizations whose mission, purpose, and daily function is inextricably linked to the waterfront, retreat is not only relocation of facilities or activities. Managed retreat may necessitate reconsideration of some fundamental functions, which can impact facilities and programs needed, um, as well as the resources required and the perceptions of the public and even financial support and sources for these institutions. So this presentation will explore some of the unique challenges, as well as we think potential opportunities uh, that coastal water dependent institutions face. So while being located in a coastal area has necessarily meant dealing with coastal hazards for a long time, from source, so storm surge to algal blooms, projected climate change will bring a combination of both shocks and stressors, including gradual sea level rise and associated sunny day flooding, uh, to increased flooding from coastal storms and increases in the intensity and frequency of storm events. So understanding the potential cascading impacts to a site and to the mission of that site and how operations may be affected will be critical to planning a viable future. So for educational institutions, parks and recreational facilities and other water dependent non-residential entities, planning for the future may include things like hardening measures to keep the water out. Uh, it may include reimagining and inventing spaces and programs to let the water in or reconsidering the size and scale of facilities and programs under those future conditions. And this range of approaches may be considered simultaneously or as a sequence. Um, so while we're func uh, focusing on educational and recreational institutions in this talk here today, these are key considerations that we've listed here on the screen. I'm not gonna read them out so we can stay on time and on target with that. Uh, but these are some key considerations that we think all coastal communities and facilities need to consider to frame their decision making. And we're going to use a case study as a more specific example of that. For those of you that may have read the abstract for this presentation, I want to just clarify that we began with the idea of using three case studies uh, from uh, coastal New England. Uh, and you can see here, we are located right now, or you all are located, we're virtual, but you all are located uh, at Columbia University um, that you can see there in New York City. Uh, but these case studies were initially intended to draw from Mystic Seaport Museum uh, in coastal Connecticut, from Goddard Memorial State Park in Rhode Island, and as well as the UMass Amherst uh, Gloucester Marine Station. So our goal was overall to explore and compare the experiences of parks and recreational facilities and marine focused educational institutions and other types of non-residential, non-commercial institutions to share challenges and also identify common best practices, approaches and opportunities for retreat while maintaining critical water dependent focus and function. So thinking about how different metrics like the ones you see listed here would be different or similar for different types of institutions uh, facing, uh, facing um, you know, climate change and the possibility of what retreat and adaptation look like. However, in the process of putting this together, we quickly realized that in the limited time that we have with you here today, the best use of that time uh, to spark discussion and critical thinking about this would really be to take a deeper dive into one of the case studies to more fully explore these issues that I just spoke about in the previous few slides. So while we hope to present or publish uh, on this comparison in the near future, today what I'd like to do is turn the presentation over to my co-presenter, Katie Call, to talk specifically about one particular project at the UMass Amherst uh, Marine Station. Thank you, Diane. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, so to geographically orient us with the, this case example, the UMass Amherst Gloucester Marine Station, is located 45 minutes north of Boston and two hours east of the UMass Amherst campus. So we're up here in, in uh, Northeast Essex County, Massachusetts. UMass has owned the property for 50 years. It's been largely shaped and reshaped over the most recent 200 plus years of use, first by the granite quarrying industry from the 1860s to the 1930s, and then from the 1930s to the 1960s, it was a lobster pound. And then in 1964, UMass Amherst developed the site into a marine research station where historically its focus was on seafood protein biochemistry and migratory ocean species, but importantly, always working with north of Boston businesses, 
state and federal government agencies, nonprofits, other research institutions. So it's really a place-based satellite campus of our uh, home university in Amherst. I was hired in 2018 with two other faculty with the goal of re-envisioning what this, what this marine station could should be for our students, our faculty, our regional partners that had sat for a few years um, before I was hired while the university was trying to decide. And so over these last five years, um, we've taken on a strategic planning process, a pretty rigorous community engagement process that has resulted in the integrated research, teaching and engagement model that we have today, just focused at the intersection of sustainable fisheries and seafood, marine ecology, coastal resilience and blue economy. So over these last five years, um, as we're doing all of the planning and community engagement, we've also known that we have to address some really critical deferred maintenance needs if we're gonna achieve these goals in those four integrated focal areas I just showed you. We've got, as you can see here, a failing bulkhead that's um, pulling on the building. We've got broken uneven concrete ringing the building, which is an artifact of that historic industrial use that I shared with you and it's posing in unsafe research environment for the people who are trying to serve. We also, we don't have a dock at, at present to access the ocean for the kinds of immersive research and teaching um, efforts that we want to undertake. So the happy news is with funding now in hand for all these critical maintenance needs that I just mentioned, we also have this really exciting opportunity to not just complete the infrastructure updates, but to do it um, in a way to showcase and tell the story of what best practices in doing our homework and what resilient engineering design and construction look like to create a living lab or a, a demonstration area for students and faculty um, in their research and teaching program uh, and a demonstration area for coastal communities and our research partners. But before we jumped in, we wanted to first understand the potential of the six acre property. Um, what, what is the property's potential? What is the flood risk? What are, what are all the risks associated if we're gonna make this investment? So we began working with Preston O'Neill and subcontracting with Pull Group to really um, undertake a series of field investigations, including a flood risk assessment, and looking not just at those three immediate deferred maintenance items that I mentioned, but the context that these updates sit within the full scope of, of adaptation planning or retreat planning that might be needed for this peninsula. Um, so, and we also wanted to think about, okay, if, if we are gonna move forward, we need to get ready for permitting, to begin public engagement in a really responsible and transparent way, and to address the immediate near-term teaching and research needs that we're getting asked uh, by, by faculty about. So on the far right, uh, over here, you can see that we did an offshore bathymetric survey of the area immediately adjacent to the research station in the cove. We did an updated eelgrass survey, identifying the location of some sensitive habitats. But maybe most importantly on the left, yeah, to better inform the, the coastal flood risk facing different areas along the six acre peninsula, we used the Massachusetts Coast Flood Risk Model to simulate a full suite of processes that affect coastal water levels. The model incorporates climate change influences on sea level rise, tides, waves, storm track, storm intensity, for present day, and then we looked at 2030, 2050, and 2070 time horizons to assist with uh, near and long-term planning. So here you can see 2050, um, it, it is applying the high sea level rise scenario per the state's identification of using the high emission scenario as our state standard for climate change planning. It was chosen because it has a really low probability of underpredicting the impacts of climate change. It could, we've been, told it could be over predicting in some cases, we'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, but as you can see on, um, on this picture on the right, the impacts of flooding um, by 2050 with projected future climate conditions are gonna become more problematic. So at, at these future projected water surface elevations for 2050, the site starts to get cut off, especially at this pitch point from the mainland during relatively small storm events. And so to then think about this and consider, well, how do we, how do we think about these deferred maintenance needs um, in the context of this? We, we zoomed out to think about what a high level study of adaptation to these potential future conditions could look like for the entire peninsula. Um, so we looked at what the future could look like in 2050 and beyond and what it could mean or what it could look like to preserve the existing functions from a, like under number one here, this 
older idea of keeping the water out, you know, elevating the road, putting in some seawalls to try to keep the water out. Um, what if we adapt by letting some of the water in? What does that look like? How does the peninsula continue to function? Maybe we, we just elevate the real pinch point part of the road, for example. Or what if we take it a step further and we really embrace the peninsula um, as becoming a, a living lab and demonstration area where we can learn from the reality of what coastal impacts on the site are going to look like um, for many other coastal communities as well. So as a state land grant university, we are facing the same issues that many people who are probably in the room, even though I can't see you, <laughs> um, the way that other coastal communities are facing, other landowners are dealing with, how do we live with water? Um, so we decided to use this as an opportunity to think about resilient design, resilient research, teaching, and monitoring change over time, and then really embracing this idea of a living and demonstration area for as long as we can. And we own the property, uh, no one else is on the six acre property. And so we decided that, you know, what is most exciting as extension faculty members, as people who live in this community, is the opportunity to showcase and tell the story of what, as I said, best practices in resilient engineering design and construction look like under these conditions and what living with water is gonna mean for this property. Um, we have the opportunity to incorporate student and faculty immersive research and teaching along the time horizon that we're planning for um, so that we can monitor ocean and coastal change and these resilient infrastructure choices over time and to continuously communicate and showcase our findings and meet with other coastal communities um, to, to share the resilient approaches and technologies with them. Um, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, but quickly regarding those three first deferred maintenance needs that I talked about, these are just early renderings of what we're thinking about incorporating our requirement to be able to live with water. Um, as you can see, this is a, 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 a floodable, accessible surface. Um, I didn't show you the elevation changes in it a moment ago. It's a mess, <laughs> um, but we're, we will have a 25 foot floating dock taped to the wall to reduce wave damage. An outdoor classroom over here with some floatable um, storage areas. Um, and the design is going to accommodate a space for larger outdoor seating for teaching and research as well, and provide flexible space for larger gatherings to showcase the research that take, that's taking place, host seminars, host events. Um, but I've also been talking with a group of faculty across nine departments at UMass Amherst, as well as some other research institutions, to talk about the potential for other coastal resilience projects on this six acre property. So this is just a rendering of some of the ideas that have been generated. And I'm not gonna go into those in detail given our time, but the point I wanna drive home here is that to choose a, a next demonstration project beyond the, the deferred maintenance that, that's really kind of focused in this area. Um, this summer, I'm gonna be meeting with North Shore, North of Boston, um, municipal planners, regional planners, Municipal Conservation Commissions, Departments of Public Works, our nonprofit, state and federal conservation partners to really understand if we were to take one of these demonstrations on or something else, what would be most meaningful to take on and why? What would be a reasonable expense and use of our time and research effort, right? So after establishing, if, um, in these focus groups that I'm thinking about, after establishing a baseline understanding of how the coast is projected to change on the North Shore over time, I would ask them about um, their most urgent coastal resilience issues. What do those look like? What have you tried? What's worked? Why did it work or why didn't it work? What is confounding regarding the permitting process? If you're trying to take on a more resilient approach to a traditional hard infrastructure approach, what is, what's the tough permitting angle that you're looking at or what are the resilience or engineering approaches that you're looking at or is it a materials choice is it a cost efficacy choice and those conversations and the information that comes out of those meetings are what would inform um, then transdisciplinary research teams out of UMass Amherst to then develop the most relevant studies and monitoring metrics working with the state with the permitting entities or others um, to think about you know, these are the demonstration projects that communities are asking for. Ideally, we then we're, we would be able to take um, resiliency approaches to scale in other communities by um, trying something and showing if and how it works uh, and monitoring long term. Diane. 
Thanks, Katie. So just to wrap up on some lessons learned, and you can see the list here, but I, I'm really going to just sort of uh, focus in on a few of these in the interest of time. And, you know, one of the things I want to point out is, and I'm sure you've heard this, you know, in earlier parts of the conferences, I think came out just in the, with the previous speaker, but this idea of, of planning and scenarios, and I just emphasize that in both at the work at UMass uh, Gloucester, but also in these other projects that I alluded to earlier, thinking about different scenarios, including different climate scenarios, strategic planning scenarios for, for the institution, as well as for the community in which it's located, and thinking also in terms of things like land use and economic development scenarios that are relevant to your facilities. Um, Katie touched on this idea of, of leveraging capital improvement to really think about and dig into this issue of adaptation and resilience. I'd also suggest, you know, one of the things we've seen is thinking about your timeline and what does that mean? And for example, with Goddard State Park, they saw this as a once and probably 50, 60 year opportunity to address these issues. Uh, so they sort of extended their timeline out to 2070 and thinking about their planning. Uh, also thinking about incremental adaptation, and I mean that in two ways, uh, both in terms of something called, you know, that we're sort of thinking about and talking about is layered resilience. And I'm sure if during the Q&A, Katie would be happy to delve more into that, what that means at, at Gloucester, and as well as um, incrementally adapting over time. Uh, then one of the points I really want to focus in on and leave you with, because we focused on, you know, these recreational and educational institution, I, institutions are the opportunities, particularly of these institutions, to engage and expand their stakeholders. And in, in our last slide, Katie talked about sort of engaging others about regionally what, what can be learned from this particular site and this project. And I think educational institutions by their very nature and mission, as well as recreational areas, have a particular, uh, particularly unique opportunity to uh, be opportunities for living laboratories to test things out to pilot projects that then can have much greater benefit for communities at large. So with that, I'd just like to give a quick thanks to our collaborators that you can see here on the screen, both from Fuss and O'Neill, as well as um, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and the Mystic Seaport Museum. Um, and obviously feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to uh, discuss you know, via email uh, or in the Q&A, any questions about um, this particular presentation or ideas, or if you have a case study of a recreational or educational institution that's facing these issues, we'd love to hear about that as well. So thanks very much for your time and look forward to the Q&A later. Thank you. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Kristen Uterwick. I'm the director of the Urban Harbors Institute at UMass Boston. Uh, the Urban Harbors Institute is an applied research institute working on a number of different things in the ocean and coastal sphere. Um, we do this on topics such as marine debris, preservation of working waterfronts, um, community planning around being in a coastal area, and very much the topic of resilience comes up. Uh, when we do our projects, it's very much in partnership with and on behalf of other entities and municipalities are definitely one of the main groups of people that we work with. And this project really came out of our work with municipalities. Um, the project I'm going to describe is a survey that we did to really try and understand what municipal staff are thinking about when it comes to managed retreat. Um, we wanted to know, are they using it? Are they not using it? Why are they using it or not using it? Um, some of the thoughts and feelings around managed retreat as they perceive them, um, what tools and resources, if any, are available to help them along in their process, and then really to try and create a space for the conversation about managed retreat. This isn't something that we hear, or at least I personally hear, in the meetings that I go to, and when I do, I get really excited um, but it's not very often. So we'd like to use this study as a, as a launching pad for additional conversation. So what we did, um, this is, seems to be the Massachusetts themed conference um, or panel. Uh, there's 72 or 73 communities uh, along the coast of Massachusetts. We surveyed 72 of them. We didn't survey the, the, the 73rd on account of the fact that they're this small island community off the coast of the Cape and they don't make any information publicly accessible. Um, they're kind of rogue in a great way. 
but we did have a regional representative respond on their behalf. And we really focused on the folks at the municipal level who are dealing with managed retreat um, conservation agents. So Christian and his colleagues around the state, um, planners, mayors, town administrators, town managers, that level. Um, one of the first questions, I seem to be missing a, well, anyway, I think I missed a slide. Um, so we surveyed the 72, 73 municipalities and we received responses from 70 different people. We didn't do a lot of follow-up because we were really not expecting very much um, response when we put out the survey. And in fact, those 70 people actually represented over 60% of these municipalities. So it was really good outreach with very little effort. Um, again, we were just trying to test the waters and see whether or not there was an appetite for a conversation about managed retreat. So we were pleasantly surprised that there was. And the first question we asked them was, has your community considered managed retreat? We didn't define considered. Looking back, we probably should have because the answers were a little all over the place. Um, we also uh, found that either people didn't understand what we meant by managed retreat, even though we defined it at the very beginning of the survey, or we didn't, or people didn't understand what was meant by considered, or people didn't know what their own town was talking about, because we got nine different instances where municipalities had some people say, yes, we did consider managed retreat, and others from that same municipality say we didn't consider managed retreat. So a little confusion about whether or not they had or had not considered managed retreat. In the end, it doesn't really matter to the purpose of our study, but it was interesting to see that more people had considered managed retreat than we had anticipated. So at least 17 municipalities had somebody say, we've considered managed retreat. I say at least 17 because there were some folks, the survey apparently got forwarded to people that we didn't intend to take it. And so we had some responses from regional representatives, which was great. And we used their information. It was very handy, but they weren't our target audience. So when they said, yes, our community has considered managed retreat, we counted it once, even though maybe they represent five municipalities and those five had considered it. So a little, um, little confusing on how many have actually considered managed retreat. But again, it wasn't core to our study. We really wanted to look at, and this looks different on my, I think when I transferred it to Google Slides to upload it, everything got a little screwed up. So I apologize. Uh, but we really wanted to know what are the perceived barriers to managed retreat? And these were perceived by the people that we talked to. Um, in the survey. And so the, the numbers in red are the numbers of people who identified that as a barrier. And then the um, graphs in green are percentages of people. So really you can see that the lack of sites for relocation, concern about public response and cost of purchasing land were some of the major perceived barriers to retreat. It's interesting to note that equity was at the bottom of the barriers. You'll see in the next slide too, that equity was also at the bottom of the perceived benefits of managed retreat. We were also interested in knowing, and we haven't run the statistical analysis yet to see if there's statistical significance to the differences, but we were curious for those who said, my community has perceived, uh, considered managed retreat, did they have different barriers than places where um, people believe their community hadn't considered managed retreat. And so we can see really in um, the cost of purchasing land and the cost to move or demolish structures of vulnerable properties, there's some pretty big differences in terms of um, whether or not those were perceived as barriers. And then similarly, we were curious about where uh, it didn't seem to matter whether or not someone had considered retreat in terms of barriers. So loss of tax revenue, which I know we hear a lot about, uh, lack of political will, which came through loud and clear in the comments. Um, those, those were some of the areas where we saw similarities. One of the things that we made sure when we sent this survey out was to allow for space for people to say whatever we didn't remember to ask them or whatever terms we didn't ask them. I should say that the terms that were in that last chart were predefined for them. So they selected from a list of multiple choice. And then we knew we were missing things. We had reviewed the literature to put that list together, but we wanted to know what else was out there. So in terms of some of the open-ended responses, we saw a lot of um, information about, and I'm not going to read these. Uh, I would suggest, and there's a 
information on how to find the report. If this is of any interest to you and you can use it in your own work, we put all of the open-ended responses to all of our questions in Appendix B of our report, <laughs> dig into them, analyze them, use them. We'd love to have this information useful to others. But we heard with, with the barriers that there's a lot more um, priorities for other things in, in municipalities. There's a lack of proactivity. There's not a willingness to take climate change seriously yet. Um, there's no place to retreat. They need regulatory tools. Really interesting. And this is um, you know, a fraction of the comments that we received. People had a lot to say. Uh, we also asked about the benefits of retreat. And this question was supposed to only be triggered by those who had considered it, the few rogue people who found themselves at this question anyway, but uh, reduced flooding of built structures and reduced maintenance of municipal infrastructure and enhanced natural resources were among the top uh, three. Um, that slide is also not supposed to be there. My slides got messed up in the uploading process. Um, the other thing that we asked about was tools and resources. So in the event that people were interested in pursuing managed retreat as a strategy, what sorts of tools and resources were they most interested in? So when we looked at this, funding strategies, community education and outreach, and regulatory tools were among the most uh, of the greatest interest. This didn't seem to matter if, regardless of whether or not the community had um, considered managed retreat, in terms of the top three, but there was a lot less interest in tools and resources overall if communities hadn't considered managed retreat. Uh, when we asked what entities could be helpful in pulling together these tools and resources, uh, we heard a number of different organizations, federal, state, local, academic, nonprofit, professional. You can't see it at the very bottom, but uh, that's really more private sector communications, media outlets, um, folks to help with website development, that type of thing. Again, we had an open-ended question about what would be important for tools and resources to be useful. A lot of public education came up. Um, we hadn't asked about audiences, but the comments, the public comments elicited some input about audiences, really um, political leaders, general public, municipal staff. Um, those were the folks that people really wanted to target with these at tools. Um, there were a lot of comments about cost benefit analyses and those cost benefit analyses taking into consideration non-monetary costs, as well as the cost of doing something versus doing nothing. Um, there was a lot of uh, talk about being able to envision a future with retreat and what does that look like? Uh, case studies came up a lot in the comments. People really wanna know how have communities done this and how have they been successful? That seemed to be important that that there had been success, not necessarily just, oh, they tried it and it didn't work out, but really this had worked somewhere and this is how it worked. Um, so again, if you're interested, there are a lot, a lot more comments in Appendix B of our report. So as I said, this was us testing the waters on managed retreat um, at the municipal level. And we've certainly found that there's interest in this. We do have a webinar coming up on July 18th, where we hope to reconvene a lot of the people who participated in the survey to share these findings, let them know where, you know, it's always good when you take a survey to find out how your responses compare to others, right? Are you a rogue outlier? Really, is there a community of you guys struggling with the same thing and you just didn't know it? So we're gonna have a conversation with the communities on the 18th, but we welcome anyone who wants to participate to join that. Um, we also really wanna dive into how to provide some of those tools and resources that folks identified as being important. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We know that a lot of these exist. So how do we get those tools and resources out to municipalities? Um, and then there's a number of things that came up during our research that led to ideas for additional research, like what, so this is one perspective, right? What happens when we go and we ask a similar set of questions to the property owners? Um, why did equity show up so low as both a benefit and a barrier? Um, so there's a number of different things that we'll be digging into further. And we welcome you guys, like I said, to use whatever is useful in the appendix. Um, for your own research. One of the things, the other thing that we're really interested in is through the comments, it became clear that this is really an emotionally charged um, 
activity or tool. And so trying to dig into how do you address the emotional issues that come with trying to conduct retreat. Um, so if you're interested, the URL is really long. I probably should put up another QR code, but if you go to our website under completed projects, it's the first thing there. And then obviously if you have any questions or you have trouble finding it, you can just contact me. That's my email address. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kanako Iuchi, and I'm from Tohoku University in Japan. Um, and I first want to apologize for my voice. Um, um, I, I got a little cold, and I tried to go through this presentation, but in, uh, at some point, if I can't finish it, I'll pass the microphone to my uh, research collaborator, Donovan Finn from uh, Stony Brook University. And then also I have other collaborator here, John Murder from uh, Columbia University. And um, the reason why I'm, I'm working on this is um, because I'm somewhat acquainted to the Boston Metro region since my childhood. And then I've been um, having a lot of interest in this area and, um, and I do climate uh, research and also relocation. Anyway, so today, uh, the title is Raising Risk to Coastal Living, Climate Change Threats, COVID-19 Outbreak, and then Housing Crisis in the Northeastern U.S. And although I had a title with Northeastern U.S., I am actually looking at the town of Hal, which uh, Chris and Bella have presented. So I hope this will be some of the complementary to what uh, you have uh, presented. So uh, very quickly about the Boston Metro region, about how vulnerable it is to the climate hazard. It has always been susceptible to coastal flooding. And actually it ranks the world's eighth most vulnerable city to floods in terms of the damage, the amount of value. And um, especially the uh, real estate values are really expensive, and then ha they have continued to increase. But nothing, a lot has been do doing, has been developed before Hurricane Sandy in 2012 that happened here in New York. Um, but then it made Boston to move forward. Um, state of Massachusetts have mandated vulnerability plan for the uh, municipality to create. And um, we see a lot of um, climate resilience activities that's been ongoing between um, the government and then also with the non-government stakeholders. And um, risk awareness on living along the coastal areas was going really up when the COVID hit. So with this research, we were interested and overarchingly to understand the intersecting dynamics of push and pull factors for coastal living at a time when residents were considering pull to suburban and peri-urban coastal town due to the need of more space and then also ability to work at home. And then also residents were considered to be pushed out of coastal locations due to risk from coastal storms and sea level rise. And with the hypothesis that these push and pull dynamics were actually affecting the coastal housing values and then also the co community viability. And so the pilot study question was how did coastal residents view and two different risks of the natural risk and then also natural hazard and biological hazard and decide about coastal living when the pandemic was there. And so um, the target area is uh, Massachusetts, uh, the Hull, town of Hull. A um, little bit about this town. It's a very small coastal town. Um, the resident explained the town as the last unspoiled gem in the area because it has a natural beauty. 
And it has a really good access to Boston with two public transit option by boat, and then also a train. And you can also drive into the city. And then uh, the housing prices is uh, relatively affordable. Um, however, the as you can see in the map, the location wise, it faces the uh, climate threats um, have been facing flooding, sea level rise, and a repetitive nor'easters. And during the time of the COVID outbreak, uh, the incidents were relatively low with high vaccination rate. And then uh, the housing price increase, similar to other uh, peri-urban areas, it was really steep, it went up. And so for the methods and data collected, um, I did resident interview during the summer of 2021. Uh, it was semi-structured, open-ended, and I got 12 people responded. Um, it was done online, about half of them, and then the other half were done on site. And the questions that were asked related to residents, uh, lifestyle change during the pandemic, and climate and hazard concerns. I know it's a, a small sample, but and also have a possibility of bias because it was small, small sampling. But um, we also believe it has a strength that um, I, we were able to capture the voice of the resident at the time when everybody was isolated and then confined into the location. And just the distribution of those 12 interviews, the age cohort is between 20 to 70, so it's pretty balanced. Uh, we, I don't have uh, the respondents from the uh, 30s. Um, and then, um, but most of them are the house owners and then um, little renters. Most of them were the full-time residents and some were part-time. So as for the findings, um, at the time when uh, uh, the reason provided to start living in Hall varied, um, it included some answers like they were born and raised and their family brought them to the town. Um, some people said that uh, their parents or grandparents uh, gave the house to them, so they inherited. Most, a lot of them had responded that they had been visiting Hull since young age, as for summer um, holidays. And then newer resident says they fell in love with the place when they first visited. But what I could say from um, the respondents were that most residents were really attracted to the natural beauty as well as friendly and supportive community. And the living length was pretty long. Um, and then the longest one was more than 60 years. Um, during the pandemic, lifestyle had really changed for the health resident. Um, resident became hygiene literate. Residents worked from home, they stayed home, um, and they followed the CDC guideline. They try to be very um, careful about this. And this lifestyle change actually led to a higher appreciation of their place because their place enabled nature-related activities. And also the low infection rate um, made people feel safe at that place. And so the stress of living there was really low compared to the other um, locations. Um, residents also saw changes on the macro settings of their neighborhoods. A lot of uh, non-residents or the visitors were uh, coming into town seeking for open air and um, access to the ocean. Um, and then they also thought um, part-time residents were spending longer time um, in town. And um, also a lot of constructions were going on, but then most of them were for housing renovations, but not much change in the um, 
neighborhood themselves. So that could be interpreted as the turnover of the neighborhood was really low. Um, the awareness on hazard and climate change continued to be high at the time. Um, resident identified storms and flooding as the challenges of living in that place and uh, have a huge anxiety about intensifying climate threats. And I was really surprised that three out of four residents, uh, especially those that lived there long, more than 30 years, relocated within town. And basically because they were affected by flood. And um, often they moved for, from the lower level to the higher level uh, of the land. Um, seven out of 12 residents, they have experienced having damage from either flooding or the wind. And then those who haven't had direct damage, however, also saw damages that's been having um, in the neighborhood. So they're really uh, worried about what's happening. And um, residents who are living in the flood zone are making their houses flood compliant. So as you can see in the picture, they have raised the house or they took out the basement. Because if you raise the, make these um, changes on the houses, the insurance premiums that will be lowered. But some residents avoid insurance because premiums are too expensive for owners who can't afford renovating houses. Um, some people who can't really do the renovation of the house, they pay like $6,000 per year or even more for insurance. And um, those who have experienced damages and try to take insurance out, um, they said the process of claiming insurance is really, really complicated. And even um, if they had premium, the coverage is limited. And, and if you decide to take the insurance, the premium will increase afterward. So they're gonna be living there for long and they don't want to have the uh, insurance go up. So other people decide not to take insurance because of that. So the initial conclusion from what I've been, we've been seeing is that the, at the time of the pandemic, residents were aware of the increasing climate risk, but it did not incentivize residents to sell houses, even though it could have been sold really expensively. Instead, residents continued to stick with their current residential choice um, to prioritize the lifestyle preferences. They even like where they were, um, especially the situation that were given at the time. And that can conclude to say that the hazards are not the most important consideration for the decision to live in place. And um, to the response to the bigger question that we have, um, we could say that while there were push and pull factors existing in that place. Um, it was not as dynamic as how we initially thought. And rather, residents stick to the coastal housing. And that actually has led to the housing price increase because what it means is that although there are high demand, there are only small supply. Also, um, there are other insights. Um, flood insurance is not a friendly solution for all. It's less attractive to more financially challenging residents and making houses flood compliant is already a luxury. And um, residents who dealt with insurance post disasters are not in favor of that system. And also the other thing is that the older uh, retiring population is liking to come into the town, uh, which echoes with the number of the interviews that I had. Um, lot, I had a lot of 60s and 70 uh, people who responded. 
And it also resonated the fact that um, the Boston Globe had covered that the channel has come to, uh, to as a magnet of the singles and uh, retirees. And so that contributed to the housing price increase, um, especially old, once older population move in, they stay, and then there's not much dynamic movement in the housing market. So um, we believe uh, further exploration is needed on these aspects. And so for the next step, I'd um, like to explore further uh, interrelationship of communal, social, and financial resilience on climate hazard. And then also would like to see if the same thing is happening in other coastal communities, uh, similar to Hall, which is uh, in Long Island, and then also in coastal New Jersey. And so I would like to thank you for uh, bearing with my voice and then also to the uh, city of uh, town of Hall and then the residents who uh, responded to the interviews. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, before I jump in, um, I wanted to take a moment to thank our client, the town of Nantucket, uh, my teammates at Arcadis, and uh, especially Vince Murphy, who's the town's uh, sustainability programs manager. Uh, without his leadership, I really wouldn't have very much to talk about today. Um, so my name's Devin McKay, and uh, I'm a resilience planner at Arcadis. Um, and in reflecting on my previous uh, experiences at this conference the last two times, uh, the sessions that really stick out most in my memory um, are the ones that made me feel hopeful about this work um, and also got me excited about continuing to do it for the next two years until the next iteration of this conference. Um, so I'm hoping that my presentation can do that uh, a little bit for all of you. Uh, so we'll start with some good news. Um, but first, a bit of an overview. Um, you may or may not have heard about Baxter Road. I'm going to mention this New York Times article a couple of times uh, throughout my talk. Uh, great article if you have not read it. Apologies for the paywall. Um, but it was actually written by someone who lives on Baxter Road and really gives a really um, a great accounting of, of what's happening there. Um, we don't have very much time. Uh, as you know, it's 15 minutes and this is a saga. Um, so I'm just gonna outline some of the details here uh, for everyone. So um, the bluffs along Baxter Road are subject to periodic erosion. Um, and because this erosion happens infrequently and is not predictable, kind of like a Hurricane Sandy or an Ida event, um, there's a sense of safety and complacency among those who live along Baxter Road, um, especially in between erosive episodes. But as you can see um, in this video, highlighted the presentation right here. Big thanks to the algorithm and uh, what Charlie sees on TikTok. Um, but this erosion has resulted in loss of a number of homes along the bluff's edge. Um, there's really been an ongoing debate for like decades, a very long time, <laughs> to determine the best long-term solution for this area. And there are a number of methods that are already in place to help mitigate that erosion. Um, but what we're going to talk about today and kind of the center of this argument um, that I'll talk about here is about 950 feet of geotubes, which I want you to think giant sandbag. Um, and they're the center of all of this uh, kind of back and forth and drama that has played out. Um, one thing worth noting with the geotubes is this coastline is very long, uh, but a geotube is kind of like a Band-Aid. It's only going to stop the bleeding where you put it. Um, so it's not doing very much for erosion on either side of where those sandbags are located. Um, so these sandbags were actually uh, installed back in 2013. Um, and in 2021, the Nantucket Conservation Commission voted to have them removed. Um, and this set off like a series of events um, that, as you can see from the, well, maybe you can't see it, but um, there's another article here from May 2023, um, just a testament to the fact that all of this is still playing out and it is very much happening right now. So. I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of uh, the things that we've learned throughout this process with working with the town of Nantucket over the last several years. Um, this is not a surprise to anyone in this room, but uh, let's start with the obvious. People need to come first in all of our conversations related to managed retreat. Um, for this project, a really uh, big recent success um, 
was being able to get everyone in the same room. Um, in response to the Conservation Commission basically saying that the geotubes needed to be removed in 2021, Arcadis did a really extensive alternatives analysis and produced a memorandum um, that kind of was uh, meant to set the stage for consensus building around the next steps for this area. Um, and from the release of that memo back in October of 2021 until very recently in March of 2023, we we're having a really hard time reaching consensus around how to move forward on these issues. Um, we needed to decide if a protect approach made sense in the short term, if an adapt approach was the right way to go, or if everyone was on board with retreat. Um, and we hadn't been able to do that, especially with COVID and half people being virtual and arguing over teams, like it just wasn't working. Um, but in March of 2023, we were actually able to get everyone in the same room. Um, and this made all of the difference in the world. It really allowed us to bring the temperature down on this conversation that, as all of you know, is extremely charged and really difficult to have. Um, but it also, I think, reminded everyone that this is you're fighting with other people about this issue, right? We're not yelling into the ether, but you're talking to your neighbors. Um, and it allowed us to approach this really kind of um, a behemoth issue uh, at, at a people um, level and, and made the concept a lot more real, I think, for everyone. So next. Uh, my husband's a lawyer. He likes to remind me about this fact all the time, but uh, words really do matter, both in a legal perspective, um, but also in how we're communicating about charged topics like managed retreat. Um, I pulled this quote here from that New York Times article I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, I, I really love it because it says uh, that this uh, Alternatives analysis that Arcadis put together reads rather like a mediation agreement between a divorcing couple. Um, that was absolutely the intent of the team that wrote that memorandum. It was an essential conversation starter for a lot of people um, in the Baxter Road area. And for a lot of those stakeholders, this was the first time that we were talking about Baxter Road as a possible retreat area. Um, it was the first time the town was kind of putting something out there that said, we're not going to be able to win forever in this place. Um, and so we needed that memorandum or that alternatives analysis to be the source of truth for everyone, um, thus the divorcees and the mediation. Um, another kind of point on why words matter, but when our team reflects about Baxter Road and how we might have been able to prevent this entire situation in the first place, um, other than not building there, uh, something we keep coming back to is. Uh, being very specific about these geotubes and what they were meant to do. Um, so this goes back to 2013, um, but there was one group of stakeholders, um, the Nantucket Select Board, uh, that continuously referred to these geotubes as an emergency measure. Uh, another group of stakeholders, the Sconset uh, Beach Preservation Fund, which actually funds uh, the geotubes, uh, referred to it as a pilot study. I don't know about you guys, but those two things mean very different things to me. Um, and I think it was a root of a lot of confusion for our stakeholders. So expectation setting. Um, going back to the emergency measure versus pilot study language, um, it wasn't clear to anyone in Nantucket, on Nantucket or along Baxter Road um, what was going to happen once the geotubes were put in. How long were they going to stay there? How much time had they bought? Uh, when were they going to be reevaluated? When are they going to be removed? Um, there was just a lot of questions and the expectations were not set. So moving forward, the town and Arcadis and everyone working on this project um, has really been trying to do our best to set expectations whenever possible. Um, and first, you know, the first piece of this really is to communicate early and often. And we hear this with virtually all engagement wisdom you've ever heard, right? That's like baseline. You got to communicate early and you have to communicate often. But from the perspective of the town, I'd say we need to go a step further and communicate consistently. Um, consistency and communication is key and messages can often get misinterpreted between the time it leaves your mouth and then the next time you go and talk to those same people. Um, and it's also really important to continuously check in so that way you can make sure that the things you're saying are being interpreted the way you intend them to be. Um, it's not always clear what people are walking away from a public meeting understanding, you know. Um, 
Next on the list, uh, we all know there's no crystal ball when it comes to retreat. Uh, all of the conversations for retreat really re revolve around uncertainty. And because of that, transparency is absolutely key, especially as a municipality or as a consultant working for a municipality. Um, put it all out there. I mean, no one has an answer. And I think just admitting that really um, is very meaningful for everyone. Um, that being said, I think there are a lot of opportunities to take advantage of the things that we do know or the things that we can define either um, with the town or with stakeholders, um, because that can help us set expectations. So through this project, um, we've been really specific about defining what failure and success looks like, um, but also acknowledging the need for compromise. Um, a successful project for Baxter Road probably means that no one is happy, right? <laughs> um, we also uh, have taken time to really define our process and be transparent about that process and also acknowledge that it may change because we don't know what's gonna happen next and we don't know if the road is gonna be breached tomorrow or in six years or longer. Um, and we've also been very um, transparent about identifying both our key decision points or tipping points um, and identifying who the decision makers are that matter when we get to that point. So, Pivoting now to some good news. Um, we hear this all the time. I've heard it a number of times at this conference already, uh, but I personally believe that retreat is going to hurt our tax base is one of the main herrings, main red herrings in this space. Um, it certainly can, uh, but our work with Baxter Road has shown that that's not necessarily true. Um, to support the alternatives analysis that I mentioned earlier, Arcadis conducted an assessment which found that any loss in revenue due to the loss of properties along Baxter Road would result in only modestly higher property taxes across the whole island. Um, and by 2100, we expect that they would lose a total of $531,000 in tax revenue, um, which represents less than 1% of the tax base for the island. Um, so this suggests that any loss in those property taxes would really just be absorbed by the remaining property owners on Nantucket. Um, now in Massachusetts, we have something called Proposition Two and a Half. Uh, that's definitely a big reason of why that applies here. Um, but there's also been recent research which suggests that maybe this isn't as big of a red flag as we previously thought. Um, so my independent research of buyouts in Staten Island found that in general, the households uh, stayed really close to home, uh, moving a median distance of just under four miles away. Um, and there was a recent uh, article uh, that came out from some sociologists at Rice University, uh, and they had a similar finding, but they looked at thousands of homeowners uh, who sold their homes through FEMA buyout programs. Um, and I believe they found that most people uh, actually stayed within a 20 minute drive of, of their original homes. Um, so who knows? Um, on Nantucket, uh, there is the benefit of there actually being some high ground for relocation. Um, and this isn't the case everywhere, but for Nantucket, it could really be an opportunity, um, though it's certainly not without its challenges. Uh, a lot of the areas in the center of the island where um, resilient development could be possible have been um, conserved for, um, you know, uh, public enjoyment pur purposes, and there's a lot of parks, and Nantucket as an island really values access to nature and preserving that property. Um, and they also value the historic uh, character of their island. Uh, and so as a whole, the community tends to um, oppose growth in some of these areas that may be more resilient. Um, that notwithstanding, I think there's definitely the potential for the town to recoup um, and even expand lost housing along Baxter Road uh, elsewhere on the island in ways that is self uh, that is resilient and safe. So some more good news. Um, utility relocation and alternative access planning for Baxter Road is actually already underway. Um, this uh, came out of the findings of that alternatives analysis that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the findings of that memo were basically like, we needed a plan. 10, we needed a plan 10 years ago before the houses started falling into the uh, over the cliff, um, as, as you saw in the video earlier. Um, and so 
uh, this project, we wrapped up the basis of design memo. Um, the field survey has been done, permitting is underway, and these three options have been developed. Um, the town has decided to continue moving forward with exploring option A, um, and it's going to take about a year to get to 100% design for that option, and then probably another year to two years to actually execute uh, option A. Um, but there's a possibility that Baxter Road is actually breached and there's significant erosion before we get to implementing option A. And so the town is in the midst of uh, doing some emergency planning to make sure that there's some kind of contingency in place uh, if we don't get option A in place before the road um, is, is breached. Um, and in a lot of ways, this planning for the alternatives analysis uh, has been absolutely critical from a stakeholder engagement perspective. A lot of people who live in Baxter Road or live on Nantucket, um, I think they thought they were thinking about retreat <laughs> and they felt relatively familiar with the topic, but uh, planning for this and showing them that this is happening now and the, you know, the rubber has hit the road, um, I think made it really real for a lot of the community members that we've been working with. So um, I'll wrap it up here with a couple of couple more slides, but um, the big lesson is there are a lot of opportunities to apply what we've learned so far and also to continue to iterate um, both on Nantucket and elsewhere. Sconset, um, the neighborhood that Baxter Road is in, is not the only Nantucket neighborhood that's going to need to consider retreat. Um, and through Nantucket's Coastal Resilience Plan, we actually um, I did, we created a framework uh, to start exploring those areas which I'll talk about in a bit on the next slide. Um, the other thing I'll note is that I know Nantucket is unique. Um, it, it certainly isn't like most places, um, but the challenges that they're facing on Sconset Bluff are not unique in many ways. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to look to it as an example um, and also uh, encourage you to check out the Coastal Resilience Plan because it does include a chapter on strategic retreat and relocation planning. Um, so I mentioned that um, for the Coastal Resilience Plan, we set up this framework, um, and it's called the Island-Wide Coastal Risk Framework, and basically recognizes the fact that coastal risks, risk is super complicated and uncertain. Um, and so using this framework, we want to guide private property owners, town officials, and other decision makers to determine what types of resilience approaches are appropriate, given what we know about a project area's current and future coastal risk. Um, for for instance, in areas along the shoreline where there's extreme near-term coastal risks, um, it might not make sense to have a large capital improvement project. Um, in areas mid-island where the coastal risks are lower, it might be appropriate to consider opportunities for siting some of that new critical infrastructure or building more resilient housing. Um, in other areas on the coast where the risk is um, extreme, we might need to consider uh, strategic retreat and relocation. So the goal of um, this island-wide risk framework is not to prevent new construction across the island of Nantucket, uh, but to rather direct our future investment towards the areas of the island where there's less risk. And I think a framework like this could also be useful in other places. Um, like I mentioned before, the Coastal Resilience Plan um, uh, also includes a section on strategic retreat and relocation planning. Um, using the island-wide coastal risk framework, we classified parts of the island based on their risk profiles and made broad recommendations for the appropriate resilience approaches. Um, and in those areas of extreme coastal risk, we explored a little further what strategic retreat and relocation would look like. Um, and that includes some of the things on this slide, but a whole lot more as detailed in the plan. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have plenty of things to add because we haven't captured it all. Um, but what's really exciting is that this strategic retreat and relocation planning is a real um, priority for the town, and they're going to start that process within the next couple of months. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing where that takes us. Um, and with that, I'll wrap it up for questions. Thanks. Thank you to all the speakers. And now I would like to transition to the Q&A section of this session. So may all the speakers come to the center, please. Yes. 
Hi, everyone. I feel like I'm so close to you. It's, it's very strange. Hi. Um, thank you all so much for your very interesting uh, presentations. It's really great. I work on this as well. I'm based in Rhode Island. Um, I guess I this is more for whole, but would be interested to hear everyone else's sort of perspective is how are you thinking about the consequences of home elevations? And by that, I mean, uh, having these piles driven into the ground, right? That, you know, instead of maybe like on slab grade or wooden pilings, right? You're creating something that's gonna be much harder to remove in the future. Who's going to be paying for those structures to be demolished, right? Um, or is that really entering into the conversation? So I guess I'm just curious about, about that. So thank you. Yeah, I'll try to give that uh, an answer. So folks elevate their homes in many different ways, but um, some of them are, um, you know, just making the foundations higher and adding flood vents. Um, and um, others, you know, dry piles or install other types of structures, and they are there. Um, I don't think there's any planning of what those hard structures mean in the future. Um, as things change, they're in harm's way. Um, they're certainly a, a, a somewhat soft solution. Um, they have to go through permitting, uh, through building requirements, conservation, and those things that protect those resources. But really no thought of, you know, what after after it hits all the debris that's there. So um, if they're restarting a new home, that's more material. If they're replacing something that exists there, they may actually be alleviating that problem too. Um, yeah, that's what I have for that. Anybody else? Uh, thanks for your presentations. I just want you to know Maine has modeled our community resilience partnership program on the municipal vulnerability program and VP that you have in, Ma in Maine and Massachusetts. Appreciate that as well. Um, so question for Devin, we have bluffs, they're not as high as the ones you're talking about, but there are still toe of the bluff reinforcements being permitted and applied for. And I'm wondering, you didn't mention those as alternatives or demands and whether that's simply outlawed. Would be great if it was, but just where that conversation went. Yeah, so um, the way they were able to get the geotubes uh, installed in the first place was um, getting around the, they're not hard protection. Um, and so, yeah, if uh, the geotubes had been determined to be hard protection, they would not have been allowed. And so that's kind of at the root of this whole uh, debate is the way that they were classified and what they count as in terms of uh, toe stabilization. So no demands when you bring back or bring something like that. Fight the ocean. Depends on who you talk to. Yeah. <laughs> there are definitely uh, stakeholder groups that want to expand the geotubes. Um, significantly, but uh, especially in this area, the town has decided that protecting that place, you know, in perpetuity just doesn't make sense. Um, it's also really interesting because on Nantucket, those geotubes are being paid for by a private a private group of homeowners. Um, and so expanding them would be extremely expensive. So trying to rally the, you know, uh, neighborhood to get behind that is uh, not working out so, so far. <laughs> Hi, I have a question for Kristen about the surveys. So hope you could talk a little bit more about how they were developed. Like, did you work with partners? Um, and also what you're gonna do with the results? Like, are you gonna share them with other agencies or nonprofits or kind of more about that? Sure. Um, the survey was developed using Qualtrics. So that was the electronic um, platform we used. And we developed it internally first, and then we sent it to partners at the Office of Coastal Zone Management, um, some of our county uh, level folks in Barnstable County, just to review it and see whether or not there was 
something we were missing or phrasing that would have confused people. Um, and then we sent it out that way. We are planning on convening. So I mentioned that there's gonna be the webinar on July 18th, and that's really for the municipalities. We've already started to reach out to some of our partners at the state and the, the regional planning agencies. And we plan on, one of the things we wanna do is first talk to the municipalities, especially about the tools and resources and that finding. And then we'll convene more of the folks that you saw on the slide about the providers for tools and resources to see what opportunities there are for folks to take on some of those requests. And then maybe also, um, did you mention you're gonna try to do like a resident survey? We'd like to. This is all, the, the report came out two weeks ago. And so we're still thinking about next steps, but we'd like to do some more outreach to different user groups, including residents. So I'm curious how like the language changes, like words matter was mentioned. Right. So kind of how how that kind of impacts the questions that you ask. Yeah, and that may involve more in-person outreach instead of a survey, um, just because sometimes it's really hard to understand what people are trying to convey in a survey. Sure. Hi, this is one. Okay, hi. Questions for Devin. Um, very weird context, but I was in Nantucket like eight years ago with the historic preservation, yeah. Institute of Historic Preservation. And uh, the work we were doing there was a lot about the historic homes and maintaining the character. And I know that came up a lot. And I know that the town was talking a lot about the geotubes and all that. Um, so just want to acknowledge that I know that's hard work. The community was very strong. The question was to connect these two things. And I was curious about whether the residents or in your plans are you talking about the historic character of the place because it's a very very strong thing when you go there and spend time um, and I know people feel very strongly about you know what their home looks like and stuff like that and another component of that is that I know historically in Nantucket people moved houses there's a lot of archival images of like people's homes just like on a truck and driven has that some was that something that came up in the conversations as a way to like build trust or like convince people yeah, uh, great question. So I would say for the Baxter Road area that's experiencing the erosion, the historic character is not as much of a issue. Um, it's definitely an issue downtown, and there's an area just south of Baxter Road called Codfish Park, uh, which has a lot of historic character considerations. Um, but a lot of the homes in this specific area are, are newer, and it is not as pressing of an issue, though it's still certainly back of mind. That being said, historic character was one of the main considerations for our broader coastal resilience planning effort um, and was really woven through all of those recommendations. So yeah, definitely a big part of it. Um, I'm forgetting the second part of your question. The moving houses back. Uh, moving the houses back, yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually really interesting because um, I think Nantucket being an island that has faced these risks for basically the entirety of their existence um, has really primed them well to be having these conversations. And in a lot of ways, I think that that experience and the fact that they have seen lighthouses move, they've seen homes move, they've, it's happened before, it's possible. Um, I think that's a lot of the reason why they are um, where they're where they've been as proactive as they are in having this conversation and have been able to push it as far as they have. So. Um, I think that's a big benefit and one of the reasons we're so well set up to be a great case study. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, uh, Brad Romine from YC Grant. Thank you all for those great presentations. Um, I had a question in particular about Baxter Road. Um, a lot of similarities to what we're dealing with in Hawaii. Um, definitely paying attention to closely to that as well as all the presentations. Um, I'm wondering if there was any considerations about the homes that were directly behind the ones that were moved and how that might affect their property values speculation on those their beachfront or bluff front all, all of a sudden now um were the limitations how is that discussed or considered yeah a uh, great question so in one section of baxter road um the developer actually sold parcels on both sides of the road to the same owner and so the parcel was subdivided on either sides of the road and so some of the homes actually have an existing parcel on the other side of the road, the less risky side that could be used to relocate their homes. And it has been actually um, in some of those previous houses that got moved, they actually just hopped over to the other side of the road. Um, so in some ways that was considered, um, but yeah, in other places uh, along the road, um, that, that has come up and it has been a big issue. I think here, um, the housing prices are generally so high um, that 
being first row or second row or third row at the ocean is not really influencing things as much as in some other places. So I wouldn't say it's as big of a, uh, yeah, it, it's not as big of a, an issue we're wrestling with. If there are no further questions, I would like to give a big round of applause to these amazing speakers. And this concludes the Managed Retreat in Coastal New England. Thank you so much for your time and have a good rest of your day.